Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira. Over the last couple of weeks, the Dadri incident, cancellation of Gulam Ali's concerts, Sudhindra Kulkarni's face being blackened and many other such issues have received widespread mention in the foreign media. Is India's perception abroad changing? To talk about that and India's foreign policy, I have with me on the program this week, Mr. Sheshadri Chari, former editor of the RSS mouthpiece organizer and in charge of the BJP's foreign policy cell. Mr. Chari? Welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. I would first like to draw your attention to the uh, Sudhinder Kalkarni episode. In fact, you know, that particular incident saw widespread uh, coverage in the foreign media. So do you believe that somewhere India's uh, perception is being hurt abroad? <clears throat> no, these incidents are very bad, of course. It should not have happened. It should not have taken place in the first place. And uh, Sudhinder is a very old and good friend of mine for a long time. So, um, but but I don't uh, I I don't think the incident should also be blown up in such a manner mm. that uh, it sends a very wrong signal about India. Um, it's a it's a it's an aberration. So I'm I'm sure those people who are dealing with India, vis-a-vis -vis economic base on the on the basis of economics or on the basis of foreign policy or on the basis of engagement with India, also know hmm. this is not the basic characteristic of the country. No, but the we are known really for is, being a tolerant people. But the problem is, it's not a one-off incident. There have been several such incidents Correct. in the recent past. For instance, Correct. you know, several intellectuals have give, given back the Academy Awards. And you know, there have been intellectuals who have been targeted, for instance, M.M. M. Kalburgi in Gulbarga. So these incidents, you know, send out, collectively send out a wrong message. You know, those who read into all these things also know one thing and they also believe that these are, these are, these are aberrations. These are what otherwise we call in strategic terms non-state actors. Mm. They are the fringe elements. They are not the government. Mm. They are not in government. They don't enjoy the support of the government of India or they don't even enjoy the support of the local governments. They are not part of the lawmaking agency. So they are fringe elements and everybody who looks at these incidents know that these fringe elements are, sometimes they go out of control, sometimes they take law into their own hands, but ultimately they are caught and punished. Hmm. Therefore, uh, those who read these incidents, they take notice of it. Even the recurrence of these incidents are bad, of course. Yes. It is absolutely yes. no point in saying that these incidents don't tar our image outside the country. Mm. They do. They have an effect, no doubt about it. But what is important is there are a set of people who want to vitiate the atmosphere, whichever government it may be, but they do it. So it has to be controlled. It has to be brought under uh, control. They have to be booked. Law has to take its own course. Everything all said and done, these incidents should not happen. They should not have happened. And it should be seen that they don't happen in future at all. Hmm. But having said this, I don't think these incidents have gone to the extent of damaging India's image to such an extent. Yes, they have not yet happened. But... It could happen in it, the future. The, 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 the winds of caution should be taken note of. Because, you know, there was another incident in Dadri and the entire beef controversy that surrounded it. Now, that has been very highly, you know, debated in the foreign media as well. I saw a couple of uh, programs, chat shows, where several, you know, foreign uh, hosts have ridiculed the entire incident and, you know, satirical shows have taken up the incident as well. So people are taking notice of it, not just in India, but abroad as well. See, there has always been a group of people outside, not only in India, but outside also, who would, uh, who would like to um, score on TRP mm. rather than report. Mm. And these people, for them, they don't understand the cultural moorings and background of a country, of India's size and India's past. So these incidents have taken place. They should, they should realize the fact that we are dealing with a very diverse cultural backgrounds in India. If they don't understand those things and if they only go on a periphery, 
this is what happens. Would you then say that foreigners or international countries do not have to deal with such kind of issues here in India, so they should keep it at the level at which that, you know, India and uh, at a bilateral level rather than no, coming down to this no, level? No, we, we cannot. I mean, it is their prerogative to air programs to discuss. It is their prerogative. We cannot say these things. And in the, in the age of internet, in the age of Facebook, in the age of uh, social media, mm. You cannot have the kind of control that you sh you could have probably had maybe 50 years back. Mm. That's, that's said. But what we can do is, we can also put out a, 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 our own explanation for all these incidents. And that the government of India has done. Mm. Mm. They have very categorically said that these are all, these are, these are not day-to-day -day happenings. These are all absolutely out of the run of the mill. And they are an aberration in themselves. They should not have happened in the first place. And there have been certain misgivings on the part of the people who have done this. Hmm. But however great the misgivings might have been, the incident has been condemned by the government. None other than the Prime Minister himself has condemned it. And all the organizations have squarely put the blame on people who have done these things. And then the situation has been brought under control within 24 hours. Hmm. Hmm. So these things should be put out to the foreign media in proper perspective. But having said this, we cannot stop the kind of bad publicity that we get. But let me assure you, this bad publicity doesn't last long. Hmm. Indeed. The, the, you know, the bad publicity doesn't last long. Because <laughs> that, is a, of, that is because, a silver lining. Yes, that, that is, is a silver, silver lining. lining because of the kind of good work that we do as well. Correct. And this government has been praised this for growth, its foreign the, policy. The growth, story, the growth yes. story takes its own course. Indeed. And this government has been particularly praised for, you know, for its foreign policy and for everything that the Prime Minister has done because he's taken it upon himself to, you True. know, spearhead the entire foreign policy. Coming to foreign policy and talking about some of the other, you know, more important issues. For instance, uh, in September, there was much cheer in India because, they, you know, everyone thought that there would be reforms in the UN uh, uh, SC and then, you know, that actually did not happen. So, what do you think the next course of action for India would be? No, two very quick things. One, the Prime Minister, of course, is uh, leading the foreign policy from the front. But that has been the case with all the Prime Ministers, beginning from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru down to Narendra Ji, Modi Ji. It has been the case. The Prime Ministers have always led the foreign policy in this country and it's very rightly so. Uh, having said that, see, the UN reform was a very major uh, uh, milestone in India's uh, dealing with the United Nations and India's membership with the United Nations. And everybody has called for reforms. Nobody said that on that particular day, the UN reforms are going to start mm -hmm. and then end mm -hmm. by 5 o'clock, yes. the UN is going to come out with a great reform movement. No, it's a long drawn process which has been going on for two decades and in all likelihood, it will go for another 10 years. Mm. So, the reforms are not going to take place tomorrow. Yes, it is a long drawn we process, but is there a silver but lining at the end of it? Is yes. there light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, see, this time, more countries have come on board as far as the reform process is concerned, number one. Number two, even the UN itself has recognized the need to introduce a structured reform process discussion. Mm. So, the 70th uh, Assembly is going to seriously tackle this issue, you know, but the which problem never as happened far as, before. The problem as far as I see it, as far as the UN Security Council is concerned, there are five very powerful members and they do not want anyone else to be involved or get in. Because of, it's, it's a simple fact, because they have the power, right. it's concentrated with them. So, you know, when you have such powerful countries, are they really going to allow countries like India and others to come into that elite group? No, there are two things. One, they themselves know the circumstances under which they, become, they became P5. Hmm. Those circumstances have changed. In the last 67, 70 years, things have metamorphosized into something very different. Gone are the days of the Second World War. Soon after Second World War, the League of Nations crumbled and then a new setup came up. And we should remember one thing. India was a natural invitee to be one of the five P5. It was Government of India, it was Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of the country, who willingly gave up India's truthful claim which was offered to India yes. in favour of China. Yes. We should have taken a stand at that time saying that we did not offer it to the Communist China. We could have gone back on it. Hmm. We could have become part of the P5 or we could have 
made it P6. Yes. Even in 47, 48, 49, 50s. But we did not. But we were also engaged with our own construction process. We were a new country, new freedom. 47, we got freedom. 50, we adopted the constitution. So we had so many other priorities at that time. So we we should not blame history from only one point of view. Of course, that's that's a different story altogether. But now there is a greater recognition, not only among the P5, but other important countries also, that the geopolitical situation of the world has changed. Mm. In such a circumstances, you cannot have a United Nations with more than 200 members and keep the entire Africa out. Certainly. Two thirds of the population of the world does not find any representation in the decision making process of the P5. You know, so would you then say that this. Important countries like Australia, Germany, India, South Africa, Kenya, Brazil. Brazil. There Indonesia. Are, yes, there are several important, several these other are, important these are, countries. These are new growth stories. Sure. There is no growth without these countries. Would you then say that what happened more recently, you know, India saying that the UNSC is ineffective, is a fallout of what happened in September? It, it will greatly affect the credibility of the United Nations. Hmm. What we are worried about is that today in the entire world, we don't have any forum which can be truly called a universal forum. So we are more about more worried about that. India is re genuinely worried about uh, the status of United Nations. We want United Nations to be very strong. We want it to be effective. We want it to be more representative. That is why we are seeking these reforms. It's not that India is going to gain something absolutely great mm. by mm. becoming. We India is part of the UN peace peacekeeping force. Even otherwise, we are the greatest contributors, or as in in the form of foot soldiers. The US only gives money. It's we who give food soldiers. Certainly. You know, let's uh, talk about the MCTR now. That is something else that uh, India applied for membership to in June, but that too did not come through uh, because uh, India was not included. So why is it that India is so keen on being a part of the uh, missiles controls uh, technology regime or for that matter, even the nuclear suppliers group? No, obviously, see, we, we have been a very responsible nuclear power. We were the only country and probably the first country to say, uh, declare no first use. Suyomoto declaration of no first use. We have, had a, we have a nuclear doctrine which is very strong. And we, even our own nuclear doctrine mentions our commitment to non-proliferation. Mm. And a nuclear weapon free uh, regime in the world. But there are certain anomalies. So there was a huge... Uh, conspiracy to keep India out of this. And we are, we are the ones who have put in place the, one of the strongest nuclear safety methodology. India's nuclear safety methodology is quoted worldwide. Even though we are not part of any of these Even regimes. Even though we are not part of any of these regimes. And some of the, uh, uh, dis, the, some of the discussions that have taken place among these regimes have adopted India's nuclear safety regime. So we are very strong on all these things and we are the ones who have started using nuclear technology for peaceful purposes right from the beginning. Yes. Baba Atomic Research Center has done human service as far as use of nuclear technology for peaceful purposes for a very long time. And we have very beautifully segregated the warheads and the non-warheads, the peaceful and the non-peaceful, the military use and the non-military use, the civil use. So we have done all these things. So we qualify for it. And then our contribution to the entire nuclear thinking and regime and armament and arms race issues will be very monumental. So there again, in order to strengthen the process of non-proliferation, non in order to strengthen these processes, it's important that India should be part of the whole decision It, it is indeed process. that in India should be a part of these decision processes. And, 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 and fortunately for us, there is a greater recognition and awareness about India's role, Indeed. even in these countries. Indeed, there is. But in spite of that, India struggles or, you know, finds it difficult to get into some of these things. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's not, I mean, I won't say it is struggle or um, the problems and hurdles. Mm. But this no, but a, we are hurdles is a process. In a way. We are this hurdles is a process. Of course, this is a process. There will always be interest groups in, everywhere. Even in international fora, there are interest groups. They will try and block us. Because their interest is not served if India becomes a member. Therefore, they will do it. So we have to overcome this. This is a, this is a negotiating process. 
and we have done this negotiation process very beautifully in all these years and we are continuing that process indeed you know let's move on now and talk about uh, india's uh, foreign policy at a larger level because uh, the prime minister has taken very keen interest and you know he's reached out to, to almost several countries you know he's reached out to the us he recently came back from the us as well but has the foreign policy bubble really burst because closer home we seem to be have having more problems with some of our old allies and you know friends for instance nepal <laughs> i don't think i don't think uh, we are having um, problems for the first time in history with say nepal hmm. and i won't say there are there are problems see nepal has undergone a huge turmoil <clears throat> it all began with the the what we call the palace murder and then the agitation and then anti monarchy agitation and then the democracy agitation <clears throat> the first democracy agitation in 1950 replaced the rana regime and brought in the monarch and in 2010 it displaced the monarch and it brought in mm -hmm. republic mm -hmm. so they have undergone a huge change for all these 6 7 years they have been struggling with so, the formation so of a constitution so would you say that now they have a constitution india has in no place. problem with nepal's new constitution we have certain apprehensions mm. but nepal has you know has gone out and said has blamed india for fanning protests and instilling no, the nepal, blockade nepal i i you know when we say nepal has blamed it's not the it's not the government of nepal mm. so we should be able to segregate A, a section of the nepali population there are again interest groups in nepal so it, it they they may not like they won't like india's intervention in certain things and we have not intervened india india's foreign policy is not interventionist hmm. we have only been supportive so we have supported the nepal's formulation of the constitution we told them that it we have, we have waited too long for 7 years they have been and in the process of making the constitution so finally when they sought our advice we told them you go ahead and adopt a constitution and you can always amend it if you think it was necessary but while making the constitution process we told them that it should be inclusive and i think there is a feeling among a section of the nepali population especially the madesis and then some uh, janajatis the tarus the, the limbus the tamangs that somewhere uh, they feel that um, some injustice has happened to them so we are only trying to highlight the fact that we you cannot keep this section uh, out know, india is the big and big we brother. want we want we want a political stability in nepal and any instability in nepal directly affects us any instability in bangladesh will affect us any instability in sri lanka will affect us any instability in pakistan affects us therefore in the larger interest of the region we are asking nepal to contain the problems and agitations as early as possible you know, and i think with the new prime minister i think he, he will be able to succeed in bringing those things you to know mr chari but the problem end. is not just nepal more recently you know what happened in maldives you know the president of maldives directly told uh, madam sushma swaraj when she was there that you know he does not want any kind of interference in the Uh, matters of internal matters of Maldives. So was that, you know, no. hinting I, I at think, you know probably. No, 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 no. You, you, I mean, it it was not not for the government of India. Hmm. They were not saying it for the government of India. They said, the this entire region should be able to decide about the future of this region on our own basis. Hmm. So when they say foreign intervention, it it was it was an it was an indirect reference. to certain other countries what not are, to india what are these certain other obviously countries obviously there are there are there are major major forces who want to intervene in the countries in the region they have been looking for all these things they have been trying to fish in troubled waters so would you say china then so, and china's dominance in the ior <coughs> india has serious security implications if china starts dominating and china starts moving in the indo, indo ocean region hmm. So we're going so to send a strong message back to and china and between then. us between india and the south pole there are hardly two countries maldives and sri lanka so we 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 think that anything that happens in this region especially the indian ocean mm -hmm. rim association mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. and indian ocean rim association region it directly security implication is on us so we have to have the strategic outreach in these areas 
And that is what we have conveyed to all these countries in so, you this know, region. We, we're running out of time, unfortunately, on this program, but there's so much to talk to you about. But I'm going to end with a note coming closer back home. There seems to be some kind of trouble brewing in Maharashtra as far as the alliance between Shiv Sena and the BJP is concerned. There was an article, front page article in the paper today, you know, saying that uh, the Shiv Sena has put the onus on the BJP. So what is the RSS's stand as far as this alliance is concerned? Because it was the RSS that you know, stitched this alliance together you know, when the government was formed earlier. You know, it has been this considered opinion of the RSS for a long time and even now that Maharashtra doesn't come under foreign policy. Hmm. <laughs> no, indeed, it doesn't come. But, but you know, is there something else that you'd like right. to see on it? Right. I, think, I think these things will be sorted out. Okay, the things will be sorted out. On that note, I'm going to call it a wrap on this edition of To The Point. Thank you so much, Mr. Sheshadi Chari, for joining us on the program and talking to us about several of those aspects as far as India's foreign policy is concerned. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time. Bye-bye.